Welcome back to the show. Today, we have Lindsay Cher Burgess on the show, and she is the founder and Moss Boss, love that, Moss Boss, of Green Wallscapes. It's a company that brings spaces to life with no hassle, preserved moss, walls, logos, lettering, and art. Another fun fact, she has done projects in over 35 states in the U.S. and has also worked with the Caribbean and Canada. So, Lindsay, thank you for being on the show, The Moss Boss. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. Don't forget for our audience, if you want to build a thriving freelance business using the corporate skills you already have, how do you do that? You got to use the code podcast and grab my corporate to contract course for $100 off code podcast. Look at the show notes and it will be in there. So Lindsay, let's talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. And if you could tell yourself one thing when you started this journey, what would it be? It's going to be way bigger and way harder than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> way bigger and way harder. Okay. Yeah. When I started this, um, you know, my husband and I did this as a side hustle for about a year and a half. Um, it started just as me going to Michael's, gluing some moss to a, a frame. Um, consequently, the moss all fell off the frame, but that's okay. And then... <laughs> We learned about adhesives. Um, and then, um, you know, really just taking it very organically, very slowly. And then it, you know, in 2018, I started to put my full focus on it. And, um, you know, it's grown exponentially ever since. Um, when I was looking for a job, my husband said, try green wallscapes. I'm telling you it's a business. And I said to him, I'm like, it's not a business. This is not a business. It's a business. He was right. So... <laughs> I love it. So what yeah. we're going to do is we're going to totally link your site onto our show notes. But for those of you who are going to obviously hopefully go to the site, you can't see it because you're listening, but it's basically you you frame and sometimes in different um, designs. I don't know. Like it's not all like square frames is what I'm trying to say. You no. can do curved and you, and you put moss, preserved moss in this. It's so hard to explain when when you're not actually looking at it. Can, do you have a good way to explain it? If someone can't see yeah. it, right, they're listening. So, so it's a green wall. So, you know, like when you go into a restaurant or hotel and you see plants on the wall, there's a couple different applications that can be happening. There's living walls, which have living plants. Um, there's preserved moss walls, which are not alive, but they look alive. And then there's like fake plastic that people put on the walls. Those are the three main green walls. So we make in our studio preserved moss walls. The reason that we chose this material is because it doesn't require light or water or additional plumbing or, and it does very well in interior, um, mm -hmm. environments better than, you know, um, living walls and, and there's not like continuous maintenance. Mm -hmm. Um, there can be some touch up, but there doesn't need to be like continuous maintenance with this. Um, so it's great in the sense that like for clients who just want to enjoy, um, their, you know, who just want to put something up and also maybe have something a little bit more art driven. We have focused on sort of very high design moss walls. Um, there's a lot of people that do little frames. We're doing very large scale commercial mm -hmm. applications of this work. So 30 square feet, 50 square feet, 150 square feet, 500 square feet. We actually have a 560 square foot wall coming up this summer. So, um, you know, very large scale applications of this is what we really enjoy doing. Um, we have processes and plans in place for how to, you know, um, how to do, how to create these in a sustainable, you know, um, efficient way so that, you know, um, they're profitable for the most part, not always, because sometimes we try stuff, new stuff, and it just takes forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, we, for the stuff we know how to do, we know how to price it, we know how to move it, we know how to make it and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have a team right now of 10. Um, and so, and we work, like I said, nationally um, and, and internationally a little bit. So do you then do everything as virtual appointments and ask mm -hmm. people to like send pictures or do you go on site ever? Um, most of our work is shipped. So I would say we only install about mm, a third, a, you know, a quarter to a third of our work. Most of our work is shipped to other places and installed by other people. Um, so everything is virtual. So we will, they will send us pictures. They'll send us measurements. They'll send us whatever they need. Um, you know, sometimes they come with the design. Sometimes we design it. It just depends on, um, you know, where the project is. I've had people call me and go, I have a big wall design something for me. Mm. I have other people who are like, 
I specifically want this look and feel. And then we design around that. We've filled in niches. We have filled in, you know, we've done very large scale walls. We've done mixed media walls where, you know, there's wood or stones or other things like that. Um, and we're always trying to kind of like push the envelope with this. We've done a million different colors. We work with a lot of brands and they have specific branded colors. So we do the best we can to match Pantone as much as possible, which is sort of unique to our company. Um, we had to develop a whole process with that. But, you know, if you're working with a national company, they're very specific about their colors. So that's something that we've been able to like really do. So it's been a lot of fun. We have a lot of trial and error. Um, we actually have implemented a system in our company um, called Kaizen's, which are every week when we meet on Mondays to talk about what we've got going on for the week. We also talk about, did we come up with a new or better or faster or more efficient way of doing things? And so the Kaizen's are a great way to keep the, the team in a growth mindset as opposed to in a fixed mindset or we can't do it mindset. Um, and it has been, it was so cute this week. My team was like, we thought of a Kaizen. We were so excited that we yelled Kaizen in the studio. So it's a great exercise that keeps the team focused, not on like, oh, we can't do this, but look, we came up with a better way of doing things. Um, and that's part of our company culture. And my team is actually tasked with every week trying to come up with a new one. Some weeks we get them, some weeks we don't, um, but it's okay. It's great. You know, it's great way to sort of keep the mindset um, sort of towards growth and towards expansion and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I love that word. Can you spell it? Is it is it a it's, word you made up or is it? No, no, no. Okay. It's actually a Japanese word. Um, this comes from Toyota. Um, I think it's Toyota and Lexus. They developed this. Um, and it just means continuous improvement, basically. Um, and so the reason that, you know, Toyotas and Lexuses drive forever and you never have to do anything is because they literally have baked into their co company culture Kaizen's. And it doesn't matter if it comes from the lowest level or it comes from the highest level. Everybody is part of that process. This I love yeah. this concept. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I wish I could have invented it. I actually um, have a coach who's incredible. His name is Tim Uchuk. And he sort of helped us with like some of these, these growth mindset things and implementing them into the team. Very cool. We can talk about yeah. that a little bit more in a mm -hmm. bit, but I wanted to tell our audience you had on your site, I thought the coolest picture at least was the staircase. Like mm -hmm. someone had gotten it on a spiral staircase or a curved staircase mm -hmm. going up. That was incredible. So my another question I had about your business, you're saying people install it on the site. So does that mean that you have partnerships with people around the U.S.? Or do you guys have to source those people who are going to install? Or does the client have to go out and find someone who can help install? All of the above. So um, we, in some cases, we have partners um, in other parts of the country that don't really make moss walls, but they can absolutely handle the installation. Um, and then in other, in other cases, like we're working with these big contractors, you know, they have... Uh, mill workers or carpenters, and they just need to be able to screw things into the wall. I mean, it's really straightforward. We've developed a proprietary system for um, cutting our boards so that when they're getting installed, they fit together like a puzzle. So it helps to avoid seams. And it also speeds up the installation a lot because you're not spending a million hours fixing the seams, um, which is a big problem um, in our industry. Um, a lot of our competition per se. I don't know. It's not really competition, but a lot of other companies that do this, and there aren't a lot of other companies that do this, but they all do the straight lines. When you're installing the straight lines, it's very difficult to make them look um, like one solid piece. Mm. So we've developed a whole process for that part. Um, so it's very easy to kind of puzzle it together and very quick for anybody to install. Uh, we also give very specific instructions to the contractors on where they're going to supposed to put the screws. They can, we can FaceTime with them just to make sure that they do it correctly. Rarely do we have issues. Um, we provide paper patterns if we're doing lettering and things like that. So they literally put that up first, mark the wall, mm. take that down, and then go from there. Um, and the boards are pretty easy to cut if for some reason 
you know, it's too big. Um, and then we also send additional moss. If for some reason the client gave us, and it's a slightly too small, they can also just fill in with moss and we're available to kind of help support, um, remotely, but honestly, most of the work goes in, it looks amazing and we're not there to do it. Occasionally we have clients that like the wall, the scale is enormous. Um, and it makes sense for us to travel in Florida. We do a lot of our own installation, but outside of Florida, like I said, we're really available virtually and we don't have issues um, for the most part. We just give very specific instructions, videos, et cetera, that have taken a long time to develop so that because we've also done enough installs now to know ourselves, here are the issues that could be popping up. Um, mm. And this is the way that you want to put this up. Mm. Yeah. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Just because it's, I would never imagine being able to do that kind of virtually and someone being able to put it up by themselves. We have a restaurant, not a restaurant. It's like a smoothie place in mm -hmm. our town and they have a whole wall that's not moss, but you know, the vegetation is all fake. Mm -hmm. It's really cool, but you're right. I, you can kind of see the lines. It's not seamless. Like it, it's almost seamless. It's like 97% right. seamless. Right. But there's a 3% that you can tell, like it's clumped together almost. Right. Like pushed, pushed together. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Because again, if you're buying those square panels, like the fake plant plant panels, um, and in certain, I don't like them in indoors, but I think for outdoors, they're fine. Um, but you know, the, with those panels, they come in squares. So that's just kind of what you're, you're stuck with. You mm -hmm. don't really have a choice and it's very difficult to make them look like, you know, completely seamless. It's just the way it is. Um, and that's okay. Um, they're also a lot more cost effective. So for certain yeah. clients, like this is just too expensive. Um, you know, I, I always say like we buy very high quality moss that's imported from Europe and Canada and the U S so you're paying a premium. You're not getting Chinese prices. We've tried buying Chinese moss. The quality is terrible and it smells bad. So we don't use it on projects. Um, and so, that can kind of push the product price up. So it's more of a luxury item. Um, they're all handmade in our studio behind me. There's, you know, we have probably, I would say like a five or 600 square foot studio that the team works in plus like a big warehouse behind it. So, um, you know, we have space to make these larger projects. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, it's all handmade in the United States. It's kind of a crazy thing. Um, if you told me that I was going to be like basically a manufacturer of moss walls <laughs> when I started this, because that's the scale that we're working at. Um, and we've had to like learn so much adhesives, techniques, um, processes, um, you know, putting together training manuals. We have a whole system for how we train people so that their hands look the same as the other person's hands. That takes forever to develop. I mean, it's taken us years to get to this point. Um, but, you know, I think we were going to talk a little bit about scaling. That's how you scale is just documenting, streamlining, systematizing as much as you possibly can so that it always looks like whether it's this person or that person making it, that it's one cohesive piece. Because when you're doing 300, 500 square feet, one person can't make that. It's got to be multiple people. Mm. Let's go yeah. into that a little bit more. We can just jump right in there because sure. that, that's a good spot. Um, So you're talking about like the documenting, streamlining, systemizing took years. I mean, how long do you think it actually took you? How many stumbles did you have along the way to get to the point where you're like, okay, this is, we need to have this streamlined as much as possible. So, you know, um, again, going back to my coach, he basically was like, you need to create systems for everything. So we have, we work in Trello. There's also other studio uh, project management, monday.com, asana, right. all these management systems. Um, and we spent a lot of time researching them. Um, but because this coach liked Trello, we sort of use Trello for that. We have systems for how we put our projects into, um, you know, how we put them in, how we gather information, what information needs to be in there, all of that kind of stuff. So it's all in one place. Um, and then if you've ever worked with these, basically they're like project cards. So we've had to learn, like, how do we communicate across the team? Some of the team is on Trello, some of it's not. So how do we communicate across the team when, um, not everybody's actually looking at this interface and we figured out a process that works for us, um, to make sure that like the information is trickling down so that the production studio, the, the team that's in the production studio, all of my Moss artists 
Like they're not having to spend a million hours trying to research that information. They're only getting the relevant information for what they are part of the job is. And then, but you know, for shipping and for all these other parts, making sure that we know and we have everything together. The other issue that happens is in the middle of this, a, a client will say, I don't want it this size. I want it this size now, or the wall has changed. That's my favorite when the wall has just been built incorrectly and it happens <laughs> all the time. Really? Really? Shocking. Yes. So we'll have situations where like, you know, a whole wall will just go from, you know, 10 feet tall to eight and a half feet tall because they just built the floor incorrectly, especially in South Florida, but South Florida's own special beast. Um, I've, I've, we've, you know, we've had walls that are literally angled, um, that we've installed on and we're like, oh my God, this is so bad. Um, you know, like, is this building going to stand up? Um, but anyway, long story short, it is, you know, so it's like, we have learned a process for like, how do you fix it? Like when something, how do you communicate down when there's some sort of big change to the project or there's a change in the design or, you know, we've gotten to the end of, you know, where we're about to start fabrication on a project and then a new person comes in and they need to put their point of view on it, especially with big corporations, they need to put their point of view on it. It's very important. So then we have to go back and restart the design process again. There's all of these different things and we've learned over time, like what the typical cadence is and then to build in for these variances that will happen. So. so you said that like when you're using Trello and you've got the board and everything's there and then mm -hmm. you ha you figured out a way to make it trickle down mm -hmm. to those who don't look at it all the time. What was that method? So, I mean, we went old school. We went old school. So before it was like everybody was looking at Trello and it got really confusing because sometimes we're doing updates because there's changes to the projects. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, this doesn't make sense for everybody to have access to all of this information. There's also checklists on there that we're really not using. So what we did is we just started to print things, honestly, like print them, print out like the information that's actually relevant to the team. Um, and I know that that's old school, but it's actually working way better than everybody spending all their time on the phone. So mm -hmm. sometimes you have to see like, what are the limits of these tools? Um, because yes, you need something that can be dynamic, but you also, if you've got something finalized, you really don't want to keep you know, everybody on the computer all the time, especially in, uh, if they're in more of a production or, you know, a creation role. Um, cause you want them to just do the work. You don't want them to spend a million hours trying to figure out like what they need to be looking at and all that kind of stuff. So we went a little old school. Um, and I would say that sometimes we try and go really tech heavy or really this way. And we find that some of it works really well. Um, and some of it really doesn't work. Um, we had a, a, a system that was clocking time because we wanted to have it so that it was automatically in there. And we had a million problems with it. Like Ooh. people were forgetting to clock in, they're forgetting to clock out. Now we write it down on a piece of paper. Magically, it's <laughs> totally fine. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's just, um, those are the things that like, you have to experiment with this stuff and you have to see like, and then different teams have different needs. Um, you know, I have in my studio, I have every generation, basically I've got Gen X, millennial. I don't have a, I don't have a boomer, but I have generation X. I have old millennials, me, and then I have younger millennials and I have gen, gen Z. So also figuring out how to communicate across all of those, um, groups and how to reel certain things in. And it's really interesting to see this dynamic because the way that one group works is different than the way that the other group works. And so we're always evolving as the team evolves. That That's fascinating, sense. right? Because mm -hmm. I don't, I'm trying to wonder if I've had a guest on who really talks about the differences in how people work with their generations, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what have you noticed? Can you say anything you've noticed like Gen Z versus millennial versus, I don't know what's above millennial. <laughs> um, so, what? you know, there's pros and cons. Okay. So I would say that old millennials and Gen X, um, has an insane work ethic from, you know, that, and then the challenge that we have is that younger millennials and Gen Z, they're getting influenced a lot by TikTok and Instagram in terms of like lazy girl this and we don't need to be working this hard. We don't hustle. We don't when I hustle. reach out to podcast guests and like the whole point is like her balance hustle is like you still need to hustle. You still need to work. But how do you mm -hmm. find that balance? Right. And I've had people like say the hustle word doesn't resonate with me anymore. So I cannot be on this podcast. I'm like, but, yes. but how'd you build your business, honey? 
Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and there's different communication styles. You know, I also yeah. have men and women on my team. So sometimes I have a very direct man on my team and I have, you know, sometimes I have this situation where some of the women on my team have a hard time hearing what he has to say because it's so direct. And so we've worked a lot on his soft skills to like, you know, pat it a little bit. You know, we give a compliment first, then we go into what needs to be fixed. Um, this has been a long process <laughs> to get to that point. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm the bridge between certain kinds of styles, you know, um, but what I will say is that, you know, um, it's not to say that um, people people in Gen Z are also working very hard. They just have a different way of working and they have a different way of communicating. And so it can be, um, it's a lot more passive is sort of been my experience. Like they will hold things in, they will hold grudges, they will be upset about stuff, but they have a really hard time like kind of communicating and directly confronting things. That's sort of been my experience so far. That could be an age thing, that could be a gender thing, but that has been my experience so far. Um, usually, you know, it's like they get together and then one person becomes a spokesperson. I've seen that a lot, um, you know, and it, it evolves with the teams and who's in there and, you mm. know, what their styles are and all that kind of stuff. Um, it has taken me a long time to figure out, you know, sort of, um, how to curate the team and how to curate the way that I want my business structured, um, so that, you know, we can have different lines of communication and everyone feels heard, but also that we're still able to get the work done. Um, cause sometimes we can devolve into our feelings. Everyone who works in this industry is deeply feeling. That is one thing that I will say, you know, <laughs> like they, they, they're passionate, right? They, mm -hmm. they are putting their hands, they're making things for people and it goes in the world and people that they never meet appreciate it. So it's a deeply feeling process and they have a lot of ownership around that. And that's part of our company culture is that ownership attitude. The flip side of that is it's hard sometimes for them to receive feedback. So that's where, you know, we are sort of always dealing with like a little bit of a push and pull. Um, sometimes people just need to get their feelings out. And sometimes you just have to sit there and listen and then work through that. And I see that more with the Gen Z than I do with the, the millennials and the Gen X. So how do you think then your leadership has changed over the years as you work with a team and then grow and scale your company as well? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I always talk about process over people. So when we are having these kind of conflicts, um, I typically, we do have an open door policy. If there's an issue that's coming up, I do want people to come and talk to me. I want them to talk to the person that they're dealing with first, but I do also want them to talk to me if it's something that they feel like they can't resolve. Um, and I have found that to be pretty successful. What I've also found too, is that if somebody is not willing to kind of evolve and change, meaning you've had five conversations with them and they're not getting it and they're not matching the style and they're creating problems in the studio, it's time for them to go. Um, and I hate to say it like that, but I have found over and over again, that is if I have conflicts specifically, you know, people who push up against my manager or push up against me on a regular basis and it's okay to be challenged. It's not okay to just be confrontational and then not evolve. Um, and so if we're saying, okay, I'm going to make some changes, but you also need to make some changes and they're not making those changes and we're having continuous meetings and it's endless. Um, and they have a couple good weeks and then everything's great. And then they have a, a week where it's bad, you know, or two weeks and then it's three weeks and then they're bringing down the vibe of the studio. I have learned very quickly and very, that like, if you're having to have continuous conversations with somebody and they're not changing, it's time for them to go. Um, and it's hard in the sense that that creates a little bit more turnover, but those people will destroy your company if you're not mm -hmm. careful. Um, and so you have to have people on your team that are on your team, right? Who are not opposing what you want to do. I know that that sounds kind of crazy and who aren't opposing your management. Um, so if you have ch chosen somebody who you want to lead your team and they are like, well, I don't like the way they're doing that. Then of course, feedback is, is relevant and important, but there also needs to be a little bit of like self-reflection. And if they're not willing to do that self-reflection, then, you know, it just needs to, they, they, they just need to go. It's, it's, it, unless it just becomes endless 
power struggles and things like that. So that's what I've noticed. Um, you know, you do have to learn how to work with people who you may not like, and that is hard for some people <laughs> or who have a different style than you, um, mm -hmm. you know, because we try to create a kumbaya, you know, environment, but at the same time, like if the work isn't getting done and that's going back to the process versus people. So the process says, you've got to get this work done in eight hours and you get the work done in 12 hours. We've got to figure out what part of the process you're not learning to fix. Um, and so to fix your technique, to make sure that you can do it to the speed that it needs to go, that kind of thing. Mm. And so, um, do you need more training? Do you need more this? Do you need more that? But sometimes it's just literally like, do you need to not talk to your friends all day so you can get the work done on time? Mm -hmm. And there is a little bit of that push and pull all the time. So we're always kind of working on it. And we always like to try and blame the process, not the people, but stuff does come up for sure. So then how do you go through the hiring process to try to match what you're looking for as an employee and what have mistakes have you made in the past that you've now been able to eradicate so that you can help other women entrepreneurs understand this process? So um, we have a very specific, so before, um, you know, I had a structure that didn't really work. I had a structure where it was, I had two, like I had a sort of almost like co-manager and manager, like an assistant manager. And the assistant manager would go against what the, co what the regular manager would do, like consistently and create a lot of drama. So when she left, there was like a lot of repair work that needed to get done to fix what was happening because of this kind of conflict that was happening. So I had to like literally change the entire structure of my company so that I could empower my manager to make hiring decisions and then train them the way that he wants them trained. Um, and that was a process. I mean, that took over a year because we had people who like knew this older manager and knew all the dysfunction that she brought and, and then, you know, kind of held on to that, like, well, she was nicer and she was easier going and all that kind of stuff. And so I used to be the one that was the mean one. And I had to hire somebody else that could be the mean one because it's really not my personality and I just can't handle it anymore. Um, you know, I joke that before I had my daughter and before I had my manager, I would yell a lot because, you know, shit wasn't getting done. And, you know, the team was scared of me. I don't like being that person. Um, and there needs to be somebody on the team who's okay being the bad cop, honestly. Um, and so, um, you know, there, you have to kind of figure out like what structure is going to work for you. So now it's just me. I have a project coordinator and I have my studio manager and then everybody else reports to the studio manager. Um, that way he's kind of the line of defense in terms of like, you know, kind of smaller interpersonal things. If there's issues between the manager and other employees, they can of course come talk to me, but it's more, I'm doing coaching around how do they communicate with him so that they get what they want and he gets what he wants. Um, and so that's been a really nice change because I'm not in the day-to-day -day anymore. I used to be like in their drama constantly. Mm. And so I've needed to step myself out of that because I need to be focused on growth um, for the company long-term. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of mistakes, I've made every mistake on earth. Um, I've hired too quickly. I've hired the wrong people. I've held on to people too long that are bad fits or can't do the work. I've um, uh, I've had totally toxic assholes that did not listen to me and did whatever they wanted, but because they were good and they were trained, I just kind of held on. Um, excuse my French. I guess you can do anything on podcasts, right? Um, I've had, you know, like I've had every scenario that you can possibly imagine during the great resignation. We had a great resignation. I mean, I had like a hundred percent turnover. It was insane. Wow. Um, and so, um, that was really rough. Um, you know, we just couldn't keep people during COVID. I will say that one of the things, the challenge holding a business together in the last five years has been like, MBA boot camp in the sense that like you have a business, then everyone gets all this money in the world and they all want to spend it immediately, but you can't get any supplies and then you can't get any employees. And then you can't, you know, like, so you can't, there's no normalization of that. And then you go through a period where the economy gets weird because everything's kind of renormalizing mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So you have staff from when you were staffed up for COVID that you don't really need anymore because you don't have the demand that you did anymore. So it's like, 
it's been just total business whiplash in terms of, um, and you know, like we did for, for years, we did zero marketing, like not one, like occasionally I'd be on a podcast. That was it. That was the entire marketing budget. Now I'm spending a lot of money, a lot more money on marketing. I mean, we're having big months because of it, but you know, I'm like intentionally now building the business through, um, you know, through the internet and through everything else. Because when you run a niche business like this, you want to be the one that people are calling and finding. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned that, you you know, you hired that manager or you reworked your hiring and mm-hmm. how you structured your team so you could be focused on growth. So mm-hmm. what do you think was the most important action item you did to scale your business? So um, we had a woman on our team who was great at documentation. And I said, I need you to document every single thing that we are doing in here. I need you to document the processes. I need you to document the materials. I need you to document everything. Um, and she was incredible at that. Like I will give her an A plus in that department. And she just loved doing it. It was like so much fun for her to make these checklists and do all this kind of stuff. So she spent probably six months to a year documenting all these things. So what that meant was I had a document that said, this is how we do things. So when we're training new people and new people are coming in, if she goes away, which she did, um, then we just have a process. And of course that process is always evolving. And of course the way we're doing things is always evolving, but we have a general framework that can easily be, you know, updated and and manipulated so that, you know, and people use trainable, trainable, I think it's what it's called, um, Trello, you know, they use all these different tools to kind of document all these kind of things. And then you have a process and a checklist for employees to go look at at any time if they're like, oh, how do I do this? Most of the time, intuitively, they know. But if they forget something, you can go back to that checklist and say, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Mm. Did you do this? And sometimes like, oh, shit, I forgot to do this. And then it really helps us kind of stay on track. So we looked at from the second that we get a project to when we ship it out or we install it, what are all the things that have to happen? Um, you know, what are all the finishing items? What are all the, you know, everything that we do and how we do it. And that's all checklist out. And when, when the employees are training, they also have a whole manual on like, what are all the different materials? It is like documented, like crazy to make sure that everybody knows where everything is. And so that if I leave, or if my project manager leaves, or if my studio manager leaves, that we can pick up and keep moving. Um, It's meant to take the people out of it and focus on the process. Now, that being said, of course, there are things that I know how to do that have not been documented. There's things that my studio manager knows how to do that have not been documented because we just know how to do them. Um, (laughs) But for kind of plugging new people in and training the the production staff and the moss artists on how to do this all of that is very systematized so it allows us to be focused on that that kind of thing so when i'm scaling things and when i'm outsourcing things i have to take a step back and think what is the process that i that someone else can do so that i can take myself out of this day-to-day tool So I have a virtual assistant who does a lot of my follow-ups. We have a whole process that we've developed, which I'm not going to share, but that we like for for sales um, and how we do sales. Um, And it has been life-changing. She's probably closed like, I don't know, like an extra two or $300,000 worth of business just by being my follow-up person. Mm. So though, but like we had to develop a whole process for that. She also helps with social media posting because it's something that like really can't be handled by AI yet, um, those kinds of things. So she's in that kind of medium gray area that isn't, you know, needs a human to touch it still. Um, and so there's all of these tools that you can use on how to, you know, like outsource different things, but you have to have a very, you have to take it a step back, pull yourself like a 500 square foot view, 500 foot view, not 500 square foot view. My whole life is square feet, 500 foot view and say, okay, if I need to go from here to here, what are the steps? And do I need to do these steps? Does somebody else need to do these steps? And then you can start to to make those checklists so that you know, and then if something fails, then you look at the checklist and you say, oh, 
we forgot this step or we forgot that step. And you're looking at the process. You're not looking at the person. And then you say, okay, are we going to fix this for the next time? And they say, yes, my studio manager does all of our fabrication. And one time he made a huge mistake. He like mounted the logo incorrectly on one of our moss walls. He, he mounted it up like six inches higher than it was supposed to be by accident. And we had to literally rip off a ton. I mean, we had to more or less remake the entire project, which was fantastic. Um, and, <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, are we going to do this again? He goes, absolutely not. And I said, okay, you're allowed a certain amount of mistakes every year. You're allowed a certain amount of, you know, leeway with things. Um, as long as you are working on that sort of continuous improvement, I still make mistakes. I have sold projects for less money than I should. I have, you know, made hiring issues. I've made marketing mistakes. I didn't market soon enough. That was one of my mistakes from, you know, two years ago. I didn't scale the way that I should have because I was also focused on having a child and, you know, didn't really care about what was happening in the business, to be very honest with you. But now that I'm back and I'm refocused on it again, those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, are, I'm sort of seeing like, oh, those are mistakes. Like I definitely lost opportunities because mm. I just didn't do certain things fast enough. I would say that's probably my biggest flaw is that I don't see issues fast enough, or I think that they're going to like work themselves out a little bit better than they do. Um, and then I'm dealing with them over and over and over again until I learn that lesson. <laughs> So yeah. you mentioned marketing and how, you know, you should mar market it earlier. What do you think is your best marketing advice you can give to women who might be running a business that's also very niche and very specific in an industry? So, you know, I have like, I think like 12,000 connections or something like that on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, we post everywhere. We post on Facebook, Mark, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, everywhere. We post everywhere. TikTok, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, and one of our main tools that works the best for our niche is LinkedIn, which I know sounds insane, but that is surprising because your your work is so visual. Mm -hmm. I would think that maybe something like Instagram would work well, though. Instagram I have, does you know, work well. Someone on my podcast recently told me that like the average income of buyers on Instagram are significantly lower than the average income of buyers on LinkedIn. And that's buyers. So it's not just to say like people who are on Instagram just scrolling randomly. It's like people who are actually actively buying things um, through maybe ads or a business posting on social media. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very fascinating. Because So if you're in a more, like you said, you're more luxury, maybe Instagram wouldn't work as well as LinkedIn. We do get, we do get opportunities from LinkedIn or I mean from Instagram also, but I would say the big stuff, the, the game changing stuff and the credibility that LinkedIn for us specifically creates is, and we're posting the same stuff that we're posting everywhere else on LinkedIn too. Um, but I have built for many years, my network on LinkedIn. So it's not even that people will engage with it. This is what's so crazy about it. People won't engage with it, but they will. I'll see them in a networking event and they're like, oh my God, your LinkedIn's amazing. Like, I just love all your pictures. It's so great. Thinking that LinkedIn isn't a visual medium is actually kind of dumb. I mean, LinkedIn is a very visual medium. You still, you can put videos there. You can put, you know, I, I sometimes will repost reels that are really, you know, kind of fun, tactical things because people like to, to look at this and they like to see it. And again, the ones who are going on there are the bigger designers, are the contractors, are like our target audience. So if you know where your target audience is, go where they are. You know, right, exactly. If you don't know, shotgun. Um, my husband and I were having this conversation yesterday. He's like, Lindsay, the people who are making decisions right now are on Facebook. They are not on Instagram and TikTok. They mm -hmm. will be on Instagram and TikTok in 15 years. But for right now, they are on LinkedIn and Facebook because they are old. I hate to say it like that because, you know, and like, so you have to be in all of these places because you don't know where they're coming from. Mm. And you have to sort of learn what each one of these tools and they keep changing. So it's a huge pain because you're like, oh, okay. I figured out LinkedIn. Nope. Figured out Instagram. Nope. You know, they keep evolving. So you have to stay on top of articles on like, here's the newest update. This is what's trending right now. So like for Instagram, you do like 
a meme thing and then you do a reel behind it as a second carousel. Like those do really well. Who has time for that? I don't. So like, but that's what works, right? Um, and so um, whereas, and reels do really well now on Facebook. So figuring out all of these nuances is just absurd, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, you spend a lot of time on this. So I come from a background in sales and marketing. I do not come from a background of Moss. I don't, I, I what? Moss really? Is, I you know. don't come from a background of Moss. I don't, there's no, <laughs> you were walking like outside people. barefoot in Moss your whole life. I, you know, and there are people, <laughs> by the way, who are in our industry who are just, they love Moss. They still make all the Moss pieces themselves. I make like one project a year for me for fun, just because I miss being with my hands in the Moss. You know what I mean? But I am not the one who is actually doing the mossing. Um, and, you know, initially when I started the company, I had a part-time contractor. Then that part-time contractor turned into like one full-time person and a part-time contractor. Then it became two part-time contractors and a full person. It doesn't have to be like, you're going to have this huge team immediately. And that's for someone who's learning how to scale and learning how to grow your company. You just start small, like start with, and there's plenty of resources like Fiverr and Upwork. If you need a project-based thing, but you don't want to bring on a whole staff person, but if eventually you're going to need to invest in staff people because their company knowledge grows over time and what they know how to do, like at first they're going to like stumble their way through it. And then they're going to be able to like kind of walk before they run and then they're going to run and then you don't have to do anything anymore. So, and every time that you have turnover, you've got to sort of start from the beginning again and get that traction. But, um, what I found is we're also getting better at, um, because we have so much documented, it's easy for us to go back in and say, okay, we did this this way before. Let's just repeat that again. Um, you know, we, unfortunately, one of my favorite employees, she, um, was moving with her husband. So there was nothing I could do. Um, and so she decided that she wanted to leave the company and we, um, and so, but I, she just documented everything. So when the next woman came in, she trained her for a week or two. And then the next woman came in and she's like hitting the ground running. It's taken about six months for her to understand like the whole flow of everything, but now we're like really chugging along and it's awesome. You know, it's just like been great. And one thing that I will say, you know, from that experience is you have to also be careful who you love. So this employee, I loved her so much. She was so amazing. Like we would be good friends, but the challenge was, is that she was also like, just wanted to do what she like enough to get like to the next thing. She wasn't like in a growth mindset. My newer employee, she's also incredible. And she's like, let's go, let's grow. Let's build this. You want people on your team who are like on your team for where you're going and where you want to be. Um, and who have that kind of same mindset and who have that same kind of hustle that you have. They're not going to have exactly the same hustle that you have. They never, you know, th that's not their job. You are the business owner. You are, it's your responsibility to have the most hustle. That's it. Expecting your employees to have the same hustle as you is not even like they're, it's not their company, right? They're not thinking about it at three o'clock in the morning. They're not worried about, you know, what's coming up. They're not, you know, like they just come and they're doing it, but you want to make sure that they're like, yes, let's go. I'm, I'm here, you know, and, and my studio managers, he's like my cautious pusher, right? So he'll be like, I'm like, let's go. Woo! And, and then he's like, okay, let's go. But like, Lynn's like, we got to think about this thing, this thing, and this thing. And I'm like, okay, we can think about those things, but we're still doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to have other people on your team who will challenge you, but will still say yes. You, I have had employees that have been like, mm, can't do that. We don't have space. We don't have this. We don't have that. Instead of thinking, how can we do that? And those are the people you want in your team. You want to, and finding those kinds of people, you just got to suss it out. You got to sort of ask them questions around how they're dealing with problems. And you don't know, honestly, you don't know until they show up. You don't know until they're six months or nine months in or a year in, um, who you're really going to get. It does take time to kind of figure all of that out. Mm. So, um, you know, and, and like you'll make mistakes and you'll hold on to people for too long and you'll let people go too soon. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an endless cycle of figuring this stuff mm -hmm. out. Um, and I have absolutely not figured it out, but we just keep evolving and keep going.
I think that's a key. You got to keep evolving, right? And mm-hmm. then like learning from your mistakes. Your your story you were telling me, um, people who just, you know, say, oh, no, I can't do that. One of the best lessons I ever got when I was working corporate, I think I was only there six months or something. And I had this executive ask me to do, do something. I said, oh, that's not my job. That's so-and-so's job. And he left like livid. And I just, in my head, was like, I was just telling him, it's not my job. Like, someone else does that. I was just directing him to the right person. But he was, he brought me into his office later and he said, I don't care whose job it is. I just want to know that it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there's a better way to tell me that. You just say, okay, I'll figure it out. And then maybe you come back and say, hey, so-and-so did this. They were the right person to talk to. And it was like, again, not really what you're saying, but it was this important lesson for me to learn because I said, oh all right, maybe I always need to be thinking, okay, if I don't do this, how do I get it done? How can I get it done? How can I have that growth mindset, right? Like I just shut him down and I'm like, that's not me. I'm not doing that, right? And it it was just, it was really, really life-changing that moment. Um, Also because he talked to my manager about it. So that wasn't good. (laughs) But but it it changed my life. It changed, like every time someone now asks me and I immediately want to say, I don't know how to do that. Like, because I think it's like an instinct Mm -hmm. with anyone to be like, I don't know how to do that. I have to, I always think about that conversation. I pull it back and I say like, I'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, How can I do my it? My brain is saying no, right? Like, yeah. yeah. So okay. I wanted to ask you quickly, um, how do you manage your business and personal life? We've talked a lot about your business, but you also have a young girl, I think, right? And you have your yeah. husband, you have a family. How do you achieve that between that push and pull business and personal life? What is, what's some advice you could give? So- um, you know, it was interesting being pregnant. Um, my brain stopped working like completely. I had the worst pregnancy brain on earth. Um, and so, and that's something that I didn't even know because as, as someone who had never been pregnant before, I got pregnant at 40, um, by accident. Um, and so, (laughs) oops, I mean, I know how babies are made. I just, you know, it hadn't worked before. So we just never had a baby. So it was fine. So at 40, um, I ended up getting pregnant and my, Um, and so for a long time, my brain didn't work. And then, so I had to really rely on my team and I really had to, um, kind of, that was a really good opportunity for me to learn how to like delegate better and to give things up better because I had to, I didn't have a choice. Like literally things were not getting done because I couldn't do it. Um, and so it was really an opportunity for me to like learn how to do these delegations and learn how to like manage differently than I was pre- pregnancy. Then I took three months off and I said to my team, do whatever you can to keep the boat afloat. I don't need you to like make the boat sail. I need you to keep the boat afloat and just do the jobs that are coming in respond. You don't need to do a lot of outward. You know, I didn't do a ton of marketing during that time because I didn't want them to be like overwhelmed by anything. I was just like, I'm out. And I would come back for like a week at a time, um, and do, um, and you know, like once a week, during my maternity leave and be like, okay, what's going on? What are the problems? Let's fix them. You know, and we had some, some drama going on with some of the team members. Again, if you don't fire fast enough, you end up with situations that are just like unnecessary and they drag you down, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, long story short, then I come back. Um, and you know, a lot of things have been put in place because I wasn't there. You know, I literally had to physically take a break. And as a small business owner, you don't, you know, and I, was also had to be okay with the fact that our revenues were way down for that time that I was gone because I wasn't focused on it. I just didn't care. Um, and cause that was the phase of life that I was in. I mean, I cared, but I was just like not in the day-to-day stuff. Mm. Um, and then when I came back, it took about six months to really like rebuild the company, if you will, like to the point where it was like cooking again. Um, and so that first six months though, I was like, you know, I was like in and out and, and I was really focused on my daughter and that time, because I knew that first of all, we're not doing this again. Um, and I knew that I, I don't think my body can physically do it again. So I, and I only wanted one child. So I actually didn't know that I wanted one child, but I got one child and that was awesome. Um, and it's way better than I ever could have imagined, but there's a level of juggling that has to happen. That is sometimes really overwhelming. Luckily, my husband is incredibly supportive and wonderful. Um, he handles a lot of stuff. We were both up from two to four 30 yesterday with my daughter kind of trading off. So having a really supportive partner is probably the best thing. I have incredible in-laws, um, that take my daughter sometimes as much as once a week 
to give us a break. Um, so for some of the sleeping stuff, the biggest challenge for us has definitely been sleeping. Um, in the beginning I had a night nurse. Um, so I outsourced that. So it was like, you know, a lot of, a lot of making your life, um, manageable with a small child is outsourcing as much as you possibly can. And it doesn't necessarily have to be out. And, and if you're a stay at home mom, it's a different thing. I, because right. I was very right. focused on wanting to get back to work and wanting to rebuild the company, it was something different. Um, and so, you know, I've had to outsource cooking, outsource laundry, outsource dishes, outsource, um, cleaning outsource. I mean, we have a staff of people to help us, you know, throughout the week to keep our, the engine running. Um, and we build systems the same way that we've built systems in our life to, you know, um, you know, in our, in our home, you know, it's like the same exact thing. These are the expectations. This is the stuff I need you to focus on. Um, you know, I don't like putting my clothes away. So I have someone, I pay someone to help us with that. Um, and those kinds of things. So, and we're lucky that we have the resources to do that. I think if you're a stay at home mom, there's different, um, you know, parameters. And there's some people who just won't prioritize spending money on this. We've had to pull back on other things. We don't eat, we don't eat out the way that we used to eat out. We don't, um, go out the way that we used to, we don't take trips the same way we used to, like we've reallocated money and reallocated resources for this period of time. Kind of like, you know, we were talking about the evolution, you know, so when you're in a business during COVID, you had continuously evolved. Same thing when you become a mom and in the middle of running a company, it's the same exact thing. The one thing I got some really great advice recently, um, from a woman who does kind of consulting for small businesses. And she said, you know, you, this is just a very short window of time where you are going to have to, um, you know, you're going to have to give up certain things work-wise. You're going to have to give up some certain things in terms of time with your daughter. Um, and you're going to feel a lot of push and pull, but it's a very short period of time. And then you start to really, um, you know, your life will shift and evolve because having small children, my daughter walks, talks, does all these kinds of things. Six months ago, she did none of that. So it's a continuous evolution with her as well. And, and, you know, there's times where I was like, God, I really just don't want to be working on top of this. This is really hard. And then there's other times where I'm like, thank God I have my work so that I have an outlet for my brain and my creativity and we get to, I still get to do this and I get to have that flexibility, you know, if I need it. Um, but we also, like I said, have a pretty amazing support system here of people that we've both paid and unpaid to help us kind of, it, it does literally take a village to take care of us. Um, it is not cost effective. It is not efficient. It is just what you have to do to kind of get through this period of, of life. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, it's just, we have decided to reallocate our resources here in this period. And then we will reallocate them again when we don't need as much support. But this is just a period of life that requires an insane amount of support, both from my staff in the studio and my staff at home. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it's it's a lot managing people and, and staying on top of all of these moving parts and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes we mess up and sometimes people call out and sometimes things happen and whatever. Um, and sometimes but you evolve, but right? you evolve. You evolve. And sometimes things don't get done the way you want to do them, but like they're done. And that's also a learning thing yeah. that I've learned from this. It's like done is better than, you know, how they got there doesn't necessarily matter. It just matters that it's finished. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like that lesson that you learn from your, you know, corporate offices. Um, yeah. I mean, if someone says to me, well, that's not my job in, in our company, I'm like, yeah, no, it's your job. It's everybody's job. I mean, sometimes I'm sweeping the studio. Sometimes, you know, I'm restocking the toilets or it's toilet paper. Like this is just, you know, we're small, you know, I think in bigger corporations, you can say, okay, there's actually a person that handles this. That's a different story. But in our company, you know, there's a lot of, you know, overlap between roles yeah. just because it needs to get done and doesn't matter yeah. who has to do it. Yep. So as we wrap this up and you've given so much good advice, if you could distill it down into maybe one or two sentences, what advice do you have for other women as they try to scale their business? Think about process over people. Think about instead of being focused on this employee doing this thing, focus on developing your processes, understanding how do you get from 
sale to finish shipped product and then figure out who are the best people to get that done um, for you so that it can pull you out of those tasks and then really reallocate your time. And it seems really slow when you're putting it together, but once it's put together, then it's like a plug and play situation. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you can continuously plug different people in and also create trajectories for growth for your team and things like that as well. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Where can we find you? Social media, website, all that stuff you want us to put in the show notes, let us know. So our website is greenwallscapes.com, like landscapes, but wallscapes. Um, And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn, uh, and we also have a blog. So we're everywhere. Um, You can't miss us. Um, And if you Google moss walls, we're typically like either number one or number two. So um, I hope that we can meet some of you in the future. I love it. What is one philosophy mantra or quote you tried to run your business by? Um, There is always more time, money, or moss to fix the problems. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Of course, I've never heard that one. Yeah. There's always more time, (laughs) money, or moss to fix the problems. But anything can be plugged in for the moss part. Right. But I like that. I like moss. Perfect. Thank you. (laughs) So thank you again for joining me on this interview, Lindsay. If you're part of our audience and you found Lindsay's advice, really informative and valuable. Do us a little favor and help us grow the show by sharing it with someone. So if until next time, you can find me on LinkedIn or tag me on Instagram at the Kiri Mohan. Thank you again, Lindsay. So great. Thank you so much for having me.